Nearly one year after the attack on the U.S. Capitol, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer is laying out his plan to get voting rights legislation passed, with or without the Republicans. He writes in a letter to his caucus this, quote, We hope our Republican colleagues change course and work with us. But if they do not, the Senate will debate and consider changes to Senate rules on or before January 17th, Martin Luther King Jr. Day, to protect the foundation of our democracy, free and fair elections. The Senate Majority Leader adds that passing voting rights legislation is critical to preventing another January 6th style attack on our democracy. He adds this, quote, the Senate must advance systemic democracy reforms to repair our republic or else the events of that day will not be an aberration. They will be the new norm. Joining us now is Congressman Jamal Bowman of New York. Claire is still with us. Um, Congressman, just first picking up on the conversation we've been having, as this one-year anniversary is upon us in a couple of days and you hear the chairman and the vice chair of the select committee talking about evidence that now puts them inside the room where Donald Trump sat and it's been reported by the Washington Post basically reveled in the violence. Um, what are your thoughts? It's appalling and I hope that the former president is held accountable for his participation and his role in the insurrection not just concerning the events of that day, but concerning all of the events that led up to that day. The big lie is the first piece that led to the insurrection on January 6th and the continued uh, advocacy and marketing of the big lie. You know, I was just newly elected to Congress when all this was going on, and I just couldn't believe that this is how the United States government was functioning because of the leader that we elected to, to the presidency uh, just four years earlier. So, you know, January 6th, uh, the, approaching the one-year anniversary, it's an opportunity to reflect, to tell the truth, to be honest. I am glad that this stuff is being revealed uh, for the American people so that he can be held accountable, and also Republicans who continue to follow him be held accountable as well. Um, I want to read something that you have written to President Joe Biden. The country's hurting while well, the select committee on the January 6th attack and the whole of Congress continue its work to investigate and report on what happened that day to hold those responsible accountable. We must not lose sight of the need to heal from the trauma left unaddressed for almost a year. Therefore, as we approach the one-year anniversary of the attack on the Capitol, I encourage you to issue a proclamation recognizing January 6th as National Day of Healing. What is it like up there? I mean, we, we see, I think, from the outside, the most outrageous behavior from the uh, Marjorie Taylor Greens and some of the most outrageous attention-seeking um, folks on the far right. But what is day-to-day -day life up there like? You know, that's a great question. So we're dealing with the complex trauma of both the insurrection, but also uh, COVID surges that are happening across the country. And we're seeing a rise in mental health crises, particularly amongst our children uh, throughout the country. And as a result, we're seeing a rise in violence. I mean, just a couple of weeks ago, I buried, uh, we buried uh, one child, one 17 year old in one part of my district who was the victim of murder and another 17-year-old in another part of my district who, was, who died by suicide. Uh, so that's what's happening here on the ground. We had teachers return to New York City schools today where uh, out of 14 kids in the class, only two had been checked for COVID. So no one knew if the other 12 were positive for COVID. And this teacher standing in front of the classroom uh, putting herself at risk. And this is happening in schools across the city where teachers weren't even able to go in because of themselves being uh, being diagnosed with COVID and kids not being served as a result of that. Uh, 830,000 dead across the country. We don't have enough treatments available. We don't have enough testing available. People are stressed out. And then we had, you know, an end to the child tax credit. And um, thankfully, the president uh, extended the uh, uh, moratorium on student loan payments. But the end of the child tax credit, not passing Build Back Better, and so many other things going on, it's just complex trauma, complex stress, and we need a moment to come together and heal and reflect as a nation before we move forward. I mean, you just, I think, laid out uh, the, the, the real, you know, 
uh, rhymes with hit, starts with SH, that most people are dealing with in their lives. The trauma, the trauma of it all, the, the trauma of, of watching a, a defeated American president refuse to leave and send his supporters to, to kill his vice president, never mind the rest of you. The trauma of just the, the endless uncertainty about whether you can drop your baby off at work and go to work. I mean, that for, for, for a lot of people is traumatic every single morning. How do we start the conversation and try to fix those problems? Well, that was the point of my letter to the president, and I'm so happy you, you have me on to talk about this. You know, before uh, coming to Congress, I was in education for 20 years. I served as a teacher, school counselor, and middle school principal, so I dealt with the trauma every day of our most vulnerable kids. This is one of the reasons why I called for an additional COVID relief package, because people are going to, going to continue to need support as we endure uh, the Omicron variant, with a specific focus on boots on the ground and, and our most vulnerable communities. And I think the president, based on his personal and professional experiences, is the most important, is the key person uh, to lead that effort. I also want to emphasize that passing voting rights is a part of healing as well. Uh, ending the filibuster is a part of healing as well, because then we would be, we'll be able to do something about justice in policing. We don't even talk about justice in policing anymore after the whole world rose up. Uh, after Derek Chauvin lynched uh, George Floyd in Minnesota. We don't even talk about it. It's not even on the agenda. What about gun reform? We just had a major shooting at a Michigan high school. So there's so much work to do. And we, you know, we do it. We bend over backwards for the economy. You know, we go around the filibuster to raise the debt limit. But what about the people and the well-being of the people in our democracy? If we don't deal with our well-being and tell the truth to combat the big lie, how do we heal and how do we really grow as a nation? So hopefully we can all begin to have that conversation. Claire, has some of this trauma that the congressman is describing changed the ground underneath the uh, Democrats in the Senate when it comes to the filibuster? I, I think uh, Chuck is going to put the bill on the floor and he's going to put extreme pressure on Joe and Kirsten to um, agree to a carve out that will address. And the point he makes is so powerful. I think the congressman will agree. How can it be fair that Republican legislatures all over the country are trying to suppress voters with a simple majority, but yet the Congress is not allowed to address those suppression efforts with the same simple majority? And that's a pretty easy argument to make and, frankly, for everyone to understand. So hopefully, by putting pressure on uh, Joe and Kirsten, they do the right thing and we can get a carve out for the filibuster. But my question to the congressman is, when we're talking about healing, do we need to worry, congressman, about our own party and how well we are working together? Because, you know, you're from a district where you really don't have to worry about a Republican. But as you know, we make majorities by districts where either a Republican or a Democrat can win. And it feels like at times there's a lack of understanding and that people from those kinds of districts are not being heard by people in the safe districts. And people from safe states in the Senate are not really talking, talking past those senators that have to win races where, you know, defund the police is a non-starter where defund the police gets you defeated. So I really worry, and are there efforts underway for the folks that you work with so closely in Congress to reach out to the more moderate members of our own party to try to make sure that we're healing within before we can even get to the point that we can heal across the party line? Great question. Well, one of the first things I did when I got to Congress was to reach out to leadership uh, in the new Dems uh, to introduce myself, to connect, and to begin to build relationships. I ran into Josh Gothheimer, uh, Representative Gothheimer, at a at a cafe recently and had a quick informal conversation and told him I wanted to follow up with him. Look, the bottom line is, if Republicans care about our country and care about our democracy, they also need to care about equity. 
And we cannot lose sight of the fact that the majority uh, of pieces of legislation that have come from Congress over the last several decades have been inequitable. And that lack of equity has suppressed and oppressed communities of color historically, which is why we continue to, to run into many of the same problems that we have. We can't ignore the impact of the New Deal redlining black and brown communities. That has led to underfunded schools, concentrated poverty, and a rise in violence. So if we want a country that works for everyone and we really want to be competitive with China, we have to focus on legislation that is rooted in care and rooted in equity for all Americans. Once we do that, China and other nations don't stand a chance because we'll be innovating at a level that we've never seen before because we've never had equitable legislation.